Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figured Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to the Xbox One four years old video. It's, I mean, I've said this, if you guys watch my uh, video on the PS4 and its fourth birthday, as well as the Wii U on its fifth birthday, you'll, you'll know I've or I'm just baffled that really that much time has gone by. But in the Xbox One's case, it's a little bit more difficult. I mean, it's weird because the Xbox One, if you think about the massive paradigm shift of where this console started versus where it is now, including Xbox One X, it's insane. I mean, that difference is unparalleled, I think, in gaming history. The closest example to it would be the PlayStation 3 starting off as a complete disaster and ending up in yeah, second place. You know, the PS3 did, I mean. And that's kind of where the Xbox One is. So, let's. what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about what the generation has been like for the last year or so with the Xbox brand, uh, as well as, you know, things uh, that I think are interesting or notable, some concerns, all that kind of stuff, and where I think all of this is going. Before we do that, I do want to give some historical context here. I want to talk about, more to the point, about what that change has been like. Because the Xbox One, in this generation, in my opinion, hands down wins the trophy for the Most Improved Player Award. Now, that was relatively easy because they started in such a shithole of a position. Now, for those who don't know or don't remember, the Xbox One, this version of it right here, the big boy, uh, when this thing was first announced back in 2013, it was presented to us more like a television device that focused on the NFL. It uh, cost $100 more than the PlayStation 4, its primary competitor. It was less capable than its primary competitor. It forced you to use the Kinect, the device nobody wanted. It was mandatory for it to be connected to even operate. It was required that your console was connected at online at all times. If it was disconnected from the internet, the console would cease to work. Much like it had been unplugged from an outlet, like there was no power, uh, it, it would have been the same type of logic. It would have given you an error message saying you can't play anymore. Um, on top of that, it also had a policy where it would block used games. So really, from that first announcement, it was a disaster. They created a marketing storm of negativity that must have made Sony cream their pants. Like, it was such a terrible, terrible way to start the console's life. And shortly after that, people like myself, and there's plenty of us on YouTube, plenty of people uh, on the internet who were just like, fuck this thing, I'm boycotting it, I won't support it, and I was one of them. You can go back and watch my old video on it. I said I would not buy one under the, the, the way the policies were. If they changed it, sure, I'll change my mind, but I'm not, I'm not supporting that. Um, and ultimately they did. It was very short after that too, about a week after my video, from what I mentally recall, uh, that they decided, all right, they're reversing almost all of those policies. They basically fired the guy who was responsible, Don Matrick. Uh, he was the uh, head of Xbox at the time. He was also the guy who had transitioned uh, the 360 from being very game-centric to being very focused on Doritos and you know Dorito ads and all that kind of horse shit. Um, not a good guy, in, as far as his reputation in gaming, anyway. Uh, but anyway, so once he was out, Phil Spencer would ultimately replace him. And under Phil Spencer, he has done a lot to correct the Xbox One in general. I mean, really. Like, if you go back and watch some of my older videos on the Xbox One, like my first video on the unboxing, the first review, and all that stuff, and every year when I do an update video like this and I had any sort of criticisms, it is seriously insane how, how many of those things were addressed and fixed and altered and are better now. Now, obviously last year they addressed a bulk of those by releasing this. This is the Xbox One S, which is of course a smaller, sleeker, more um, affordable version of the same console. It doesn't have stupid dependencies like the Kinect and all that kind of stuff, although you can use it optionally. Um, it's just a better machine. Now, what I want to talk to you about uh, is basically three things that remain issues with this console that Microsoft addressed this year. Um, and that's how I would describe, the way I would describe this year for Microsoft in general was very turbulent. There were some really good ups, there were some really good downs, and there were some other really good ups. So, yeah, the, the first point of those three was of all the issues that persisted into the Xbox One going into 2017, uh, the biggest one was still that it was ultimately anemic compared to its primary competitor, the PlayStation 4. Sony, of course, released the PS4 Pro, which was even more of a gap between themselves and the Xbox One. Now, we knew that the Xbox One X at the time Project Scorpio was coming, so we knew something was happening, it wasn't a secret, we knew that an issue would ultimately be resolved in some capacity, but finally it happened. At the time I make this video, the Xbox One X came out two weeks ago. 
Now the Xbox One X is a vastly more capable version of the Xbox One. It's essentially a 4K capable gaming console. Maybe not in the most perfect of respects, there are definitely PCs more capable than it, but for what you're paying, $500 for it, it is probably the best bargain on the market, at least the time I make this. Um, now, it's very early in the thing's lifespan, so again, I'm making this about two weeks after it launched, so there's not a whole lot of sales information, but what we have seen so far is that it is doing pretty well with early adopters, and that's good. I have used one, I don't own one, but I have used one, and I have to say it was very impressive. It's a very nice piece of technology. It's getting very good reviews from a lot of people, um, and that's awesome. So, I it basically addressed all the hardware differential problems that the Xbox One had, and it actually jumped it like way beyond expectations. I mean, people are comparing it to the PS4 Pro and saying they aren't even the same generation. Like, Xbox One X is in its, in the, it's in the ninth gen, while PS4 Pro is still in the eighth gen. You know what I'm saying? Some people are saying that there's as much as a 40% increase in capability in that machine over the PS4 Pro, not to mention the base PS4, or of course, the base Xbox One. It's a very strange generation because what both Microsoft and Sony did by basically doing these mid-cycle refreshes, essentially unprecedented, uh, with the one exception being the new 3DS by Nintendo, but that was a handheld device. Um, throughout history, it has been the norm that once you release a game console, you're hardware locked for the duration of that generation. Sure, you can do things like add the Sega CD or the 32X or something like that, but for the most part, your base console has to stay the same, plus or minus just a handful of features here and there. But in this case, Sony broke that mold by saying, you know what, fuck it, we're going to make it socially acceptable to make a more capable version of our same console, and Microsoft really took that idea and put it on crack. So, I'm still not a big fan of that concept, but that may not really matter much, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the video. But that said, I have used the console, and I think it's fantastic, and I'm very much looking forward to getting one eventually. However, because I don't have a 4K TV, it's not a huge motivator, but someone pointed this out to me, and they made a very interesting point. It's like, dude, the TV shouldn't be the motivator to get the Xbox One X. The Xbox One X should be the motivator to get the 4K TV. In other words, buy the Xbox One X because then you'll have a real reason to go buy a 4K TV instead of the other way around. And it's a valid point. So, but that's of course a big financial endeavor. And How many people are going to make that jump? I don't know. That's what we'll find out throughout the course of this year. In my PS4 video, I made a prediction that I believed that the PS4 Pro will ultimately outsell the Xbox One X in uh, 2018. I said that with the proviso, and I, this is true, whoever has the better bundle. Now, I think Sony's in a great position where they could drop the PS4 Pro to like $350, maybe even $300, or just include a bunch of games and give you more for your money, and basically say like, look, it's not as capable, we get that, but look at all the games you get with it and look how much cheaper it is. Because the, the Xbox One X is $500, the PS4 Pro is $400, you drop that down. That savings is, is really tempting for a lot of people. Um, if they do that, I could see them sticking it out. However, Microsoft has a tendency to also make bundles very quickly, which is actually why I haven't bought one yet. Is I was basically like, look, Microsoft is going to drop the thing 50 to 100 bucks, probably around Black Friday. Maybe we'll see. I don't know that yet, obviously. Um, or you know, by the holidays at some point, they'll do something. They always do. Um, and if not, I'm not in a real rush. I can I can wait on that. So I think that will happen. And if they make a better bundle, I could see the Xbox One X actually outperforming the PS4. Ultimately, it, it comes down to whoever is going to make the best bundle. I want to be very clear in what I'm saying, though. I am not suggesting that the Xbox One will surpass the PS4 as a whole. I simply, like, including all previous sales, that's, I think, an impossible task for anyone not named Nintendo Switch. They've got a small chance, but even that's a really long shot. Um, but the Xbox One X may simply outsell the PS4 in the calendar year of 2018 or the other way around. Obviously, one of them is going to. We just don't know which. And I, my opinion, it boils down to whoever makes the better bundle. I think Sony's in a better position to do that, but I still... Sony doesn't strike me as one that might actually do it. It's hard to say. We will see. But if Microsoft puts out the Xbox One X at $400 and Sony doesn't adjust, there's no reason to get a PS4 Pro other than well, debatably better game content, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, that's the first issue, was the hardware. They addressed it, they addressed it really fucking well. The next issue that I've always had with the Xbox One, I've been saying it since day one, is literally the name of the console. The Xbox One is a horrible, stupid name. 
Um, now, there's nothing you can really do to change that. They tinkered, you know, Xbox One S, Xbox One X. Um, but really, you can't just change the name unless you come out with an entirely new console. So they could have said, hey, you know what, we're moving on from Xbox One, Xbox One X. Could have just been Xbox Scorpio. It could have been a ninth gen console or some shit. They didn't do that, which I'm, I'm actually glad they didn't. Um, but there was no other way to really change the name. So the best you can do is start to justify the name. Now, people forget, and I don't blame them, because it was mixed up in that whole original storm of DRM bullshit that uh, Microsoft tried at the beginning. Uh, but one of the original justifications for the name Xbox One was the concept that it's, it's all-in-one Xbox. It's got everything you need all in one device. That was the logic. Now, it was a horrible misfire, because it really had nothing you wanted. It had nothing but bullshit in it. Um, however, they did tackle that a bit more this year. The Xbox One X, of course, has your 4K gaming capable console, it has your uh, 4K Blu-rays, your 4K streaming, it has, it has all that kind of shit in one. It can play music CDs, it can play DVDs, it can play Blu-rays, 4K Blu-rays, and so on. But it also now can play Xbox 360 games and even original Xbox games. Granted, not in a complete sense, um, but your, your games are there. You can have all your original your Xbox One games as well as uh, enhanced Xbox One gaming experiences uh, through the Xbox One X meaning certain games that were older that weren't designed to run in 4K now do um, because they've been patched, or you now have the 360 and original Xbox backwards compatibility, which also are enhanced. So while I don't personally believe they will ever complete the 360 backwards compatibility program, and I know they'll never complete the original Xbox backwards compatibility program, the logic that they are essentially all now in one device does help justify the name a bit. It doesn't make me like the name. It just kind of improves it. Um, and I always thought that was kind of a missed opportunity. If, those con if the console had launched with real backwards compatibility, not the version of it they're giving us, uh, the way that they give us it now, the console will detect your disc, an Xbox 360 or original Xbox disc. It will detect what it is and download an emulated build of it to the console. I don't like that. However, it is a free service, so you can't really knock it. It is superior to both Sony and Nintendo in the sense that their policy is on backwards, compatibil on backwards compatibility is fuck you, give me money to re-download it. Whereas our, Microsoft's is, hey, if you got the disc from 15 years ago and it's compatible, stick it in and it's going to work. You have to download it first, but it'll work. I like that policy better, although I would have preferred it was done kind of like the way that Wii U did it with original Wii compatibility where you just put the disc in and it actually reads off the disc. But that was never going to happen unless it had been built that way from the get-go. So, I always felt that had they done that originally, that the name would have made more sense. Because it would have been all Xbox, all in one. Um, then there's plenty of slogans you can come up with for that. You know, all in one Xbox, uh, Xbox One, the only one you need. You know, weird things like that. They could have done. And this helps to justify that. So that's, I'm glad they finally tackled that in some regard. And I'm also, of course, excited because they actually added uh, original Xbox backwards compatibility. Now, if you guys have been watching me for a while, you know that was a big deal to me. Like, I had been harping on that for years and how much I wanted that. And, you know, I even at one point talked to Chris Charla and Major Nelson about it, uh, trying to push that. And I, when E3 happened, I was actually at E3 in Los Angeles when they announced it, and it was holy shit moment. Like, that was, that was far and away the most exciting thing that happened at E3, in my opinion. Um, other than the fact that I got to be really close to Miyamoto, that was, but that's a totally different thing. Um, but yeah, that was, that was awesome. And I'm glad they've, they are actually rolling that out. I never expect that program to be completed, though. Um, only 13 games at this point in time are supported, and I think we'll be lucky if even 100 games are ever supported, uh, mostly due to licensing issues. Uh, but I've talked about that a lot in its own video, so there's no reason to continue on that. Now, the last of those three issues they wanted, I wanted them to address is the middle part <laughs> that I was talking about before. You know, there's the high, there's the low, and there's the high. You got, you know, the Xbox One X, you got back to compatibility, but then you have exclusive worthwhile game content. And this is where Microsoft has always suffered with the Xbox One. Now, to put this, I mean, we all understand the concept that you need a good game on a game console. That all makes sense to us, but I want to analyze it a little bit deeper than that. The Xbox brand this generation has really not cared too much about uh, gaming experiences that you can only have on Xbox One. Um, to put that in comparison, when it comes to, let's say you're a PC gamer, right? Now, I'll bet you as a PC gamer, I'm not one, but I'm betting you that you pretty much always pick your PC to game on. The only time you ever break exception is if there is some really worthwhile game on a different platform. Uh, something like The Last of Us was probably the biggest justifier in a lot of cases to pick up a PlayStation 4 or a PlayStation 3, um, if you've got that version. 
uh, if you're a Nintendo, of course, Nintendo is a completely different thing. If you want to play Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Super Mario Odyssey, Mario Kart 8, whatever, um, you needed to get a Wii U or a Switch. Now, I, I can't tell you how many times over the years I've seen comments to back that up. I, I see a lot of PC gamers will identify themselves, and the, you guys always do. You always feel the need to do that. I don't know why, but you always feel the need to do it. But a lot of the times when I, I'll see comments like that, like, no, fuck consoles, fuck exclusives, fuck all that. I just need my gaming PC and my Wii U or my Switch. It's like, don't you get it? <laughs> like, the reason you need those is because of exclusive content. Now, I want to be very clear that I understand the inherent evil nature of an exclusive game. It's fundamentally annoying because what it is is a game that is designed to you know, force you to buy another piece of technology you don't necessarily want. I get it. I completely understand why it pisses people off because they, want, they would love it. If all their gaming experiences were on one particular device, they wouldn't have to spend on other things. But you, you have to look at the other side of that. If there is no exclusive content, there's nothing driving you to that console or platform. There's no reason for it to exist, which I'm, I'm sure is the case a lot of PC gamers would make, which is, yeah, fuck consoles. They don't need to exist. That's a different argument in and of itself. But for the point is, right now, Nintendo obviously does a great job with this. They give you a constant justified reason to own their hardware. Even a lot of PC gamers will admit to that, saying, like, yes, I had to break down and get one because I needed that game. I got it. Sony has been trying to do that forever, and the one time they were ever able to really crack that ceiling was with The Last of Us. Now, I'm not saying they haven't had other good exclusive content. They certainly have, but they haven't been able to put any other game out there that really just drives the masses to buy it other than The Last of Us. Microsoft is interesting in the sense that their policy is to actively not do that at all. They're not even trying to play that game. Um, there might be a couple of exclusive games for the Xbox One from the early days, but beyond that, there's really nothing on this console that comes out ever that is truly exclusive to this platform. There are games that come out for it that are not available on Nintendo or Sony hardware, that is true, things like Cuphead, but that game exists on PC. There is essentially no reason to own an Xbox One if you game on PC. And they're not even trying to bring you over. In fact, they're doing exactly the opposite. They're trying to keep you on PC by saying, hey, look, you got a PC already. You can buy Cuphead and it'll just work on Windows 10. Maybe they're trying to kick you off of Steam. That's a little different. But um, off of PC, no. So it puts the Xbox in an interesting position where it's... While it is a good game console in a lot of ways, and while it ultimately has a lot of great experiences on it, we are going to look back on this thing and be like, there was nothing on the Xbox One you couldn't play somewhere else. And that's that means it will be worthless in the future. I just want to put that out there. Um, I'm calling it now. It will be worthless in the future for that reason. I mean, it could be eons from now, but it, it will be ultimately a, a complete coaster because of the lack of content uh, that's kind of what makes a console valuable as history goes on is the fact that there's certain things you can only get there um, I just the Xbox one does not have that and it, it's not trying to that's part of their whole Windows 10 play anywhere policy now uh, that said Microsoft has had a series even if you say fine I don't care let's just I still want good gaming experiences on my Xbox one because that's what I have I don't even have a gaming PC or I don't play on PC I still want experiences on my Xbox one you're absolutely right to want that that said, they make things like Super Lucky's Tale, they make Cuphead, um, you know, stuff like that. Those are their exclusives that drive you to the Xbox One if you're strictly a console gamer. Now, those have been a mixed bag. Cuphead was their biggest game of the year, and it was, it was fantastic, but even it did not get a physical release, although supposedly that is coming. Things like Super Lucky Tale, it was nice that that showed up, but I mean, was I not the only one who saw the first ad for that and went, oh shit, awesome, they're making a new Congress Bad Friday game. Oh wait, what the hell is this? It was like a little kid's game. And it's fine, it was not a bad game or anything, it just wasn't what I think a lot of us would have wanted. Um, you get things like Forza 7, which is, you know, exclusive again to PC and uh, Xbox One. Though that's not a game that's going to drive me to the platform. Uh, Forza 7 was unfortunately the only thing that Microsoft had to launch the Xbox One X with, because the other problem they had was that they were canceling a lot of their better and bigger titles. Things like Scalebound, uh, things like Fable Legends got the axe, things like Crackdown didn't get the axe, but it got delayed. Although I'm glad it got delayed, because if there was a problem with it, take your time, fix it. Um, we want it to be good when it comes out. But that meant the Xbox One X came out, and it mostly, actually, it's funny enough, it relied on Forza, and it relied on Assassin's Creed Origins, which is, of course, a Ubisoft game. So they, at some point, must have cut a deal with them and said, hey, look, because, I mean, even back at E3, 
I got to play Assassin's Creed Origins at, uh, at the Ubisoft loft and it was all running on Xbox One X's. It's very clear that Microsoft knew they weren't going to have a whole bunch of 4K gaming content for the Xbox One X when it launched, so they wanted something to be more impressive. So they obviously cut out some sort of deal with, my, oh, with Ubisoft to have that be like the big title that they helped push with the console. I mean, there was even a bundled version of the game. My point is that Microsoft has not been very good at giving you worthwhile gaming experiences you can only get on Xbox. And unfortunately, I don't think they're ever going to fix that. So the best thing you can do is get worthwhile gaming experiences, at least from a console perspective, that you can only get on Xbox. And hopefully they continue to do that. Although, they haven't given me much reason to think that 2018 is going to be better in that regard, but it needs to be. Because this year, they got away with it because they included, they, uh, they excited us, a lot of us, uh, they energized the base with original Xbox backwards compatibility, which I know people point out quickly that backwards compatibility actually statistically has very little usage. And that's true. The thing is, you have to understand that it's not so much about actually playing that stuff. It's more about being able to say it has it and just being able to excite the base and getting consumer confidence in the item. The fact that the Xbox One is capable of playing 360 and original Xbox games is inherently exciting. It inherently makes you feel like, okay, they really have got my back on this because I bought those games from years ago and I'm still going to be able to use them. I trust you more. Even if you never actually sit down and play anything. That's more what it's about than actually sitting down and playing it. I know it sounds dumb, but essentially consider it more marketing than anything else. And it works. Um, but um, they, yeah, they, that said, they still need to make games that are actually Xbox One games that are exciting. They had that going for them and they had the promise of Xbox One X. But when it comes to exclusive, exciting gaming experiences, that is the big thing they need to work on for 2018. And unfortunately, other than Crackdown 3, I can't, I mean off the top of my head anyway, I can't think of anything else that's really going to push that. I mean, I know there's games they've been talking about for years, like uh, that game Rare has been working on with Sea of Thieves, you know, stuff like that. But what else? You know, I, I just I hope that they work more on that. That needs to be the next big project is to focus on the exclusive gaming content. Now, with all that said, what do I think the future of Xbox is beyond just the next year? What is ultimately going to happen with the product in general? Now, if you've been watching me for a long time, you'll know that I've very much been on the record, even back as far as 2013, I think it was, I made a video about um, how I figured the 8th generation was the last traditional home console generation. Now, that was a prediction, and some of which has come true, some of which has not, obviously. But um, I, I still think that, essentially, I was basically on target. Now, what I said at the time was that I believed Nintendo would make another console after the Wii U. They did, the Nintendo Switch. Um, I said that what I believed would happen with Sony is that they would either make like a little streaming box or something like that or go all software for the PlayStation 5. My position on that has changed and I need to justify that and explain that in this video again to make my point with Xbox. So hold, hold out for a second. Basically, I consistently believed that Sony was going to push an all digital route. Um, we got comments from things, people like Shuhei Yoshida, a guy who runs the fucking PlayStation division, saying that <clears throat> they really wanted to do that. that. They weren't really sure they were going to do hardware, they were more interested in software. They were integrating things like PS Now into televisions and stuff like that. I figured that was their plan. Um, however, what changed my mind on this was I went to Japan twice this year. Just luckily that actually happened, that was very cool. But um, having visited there, I understand now that Sony can't do that yet. Uh, and I want to make this extremely clear because my, I have mentioned this a couple of times and what I've said has been horribly misinterpreted and I, I don't want to give that impression because people think I'm saying Japan is like dumb or sucks or something like that, which is not at all the case I'm making. Japan is wonderful. It's a great place. It's like my number one country to check out now. It's awesome. I can't wait to go back. But the truth is the PC as a concept of a piece of technology has really never taken off there. Laptops exist, but they're perceived more as like digital typewriters. They're not, it's just not a thing. It never took off like it did in the West. Now what that means is you can't basically transition from homes like consoles to like a Steam competitor in Japan. It can't happen because Steam itself really doesn't function in Japan. Um, so Sony, being a Japanese company, has to care about what their home country is doing socially. Now, to be very clear on this, Japan's internet infrastructure is perfectly fine. Their mobile devices work incredibly well. You know, your Wi-Fi, your landlines in a hotel, if you bring a laptop, whatever, it's all going to work just fine. 
I've never made that claim, though people have horribly misunderstood saying that I was implying they were like a third world country or some shit, which is not at all the case. The truth is they just don't have PCs. It's just how it is. They don't care. They're more into physical media and they're not really socially ready to move on to the next step. That's just how it is. Um, now, when it comes to the three guys, the three competitors, uh, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, Nintendo looks at Japan and goes, we're a Japanese company and Japan's what we care about. We're going to focus all our decisions will be based on Japanese trends, Japanese interests, all that stuff, and the West gets the fallout of whatever we do. So Nintendo looked at Japan and said, hey, home consoles aren't doing as well anymore, portables are doing really well, let's make the switch. That way you have the portability and you have the home console part if you care about that. And then that's what they focused on. And then we over here were like, cool! That's how they focused on it. But they didn't really care, ultimately, what trends over here were doing. Trends here would have been like, hey, don't include just 32 gigabytes of storage, you know, um, and stuff like that. We would have said, make a couple other changes, make it more capable. Fuck you, we don't care, we're focusing on Japan. That's Nintendo, that's fine. That's their myopic view, that's how they operate, that's how they do. Um, Sony is in a weird position, though, because they have to focus on all three markets. They're a Japanese company that's essentially an American company. I mean, the, the PS4 was designed by Mark Cerny, he's an American. Um, so they have to look at all three markets and say, we are socially relevant to all three of these, and we need to care about all three of these because we're a big technology company, as opposed to Nintendo, who is a toy company, fundamentally, who happens to make video games. That's true. Um, so they looked at all the markets and said, all right, we, we can still function with physical media in all three and still have a digital platform. We can do all these things. That this, they have, whatever they have to do, they have to be uniform. They can't be like Sega back in the day where they just don't agree on what they're doing in different markets. Um, so that's why I think Sony is going to behave more like that. And I talked more about it in my PS4 video. Microsoft, on the other hand, has never been relevant in Japan. The Xbox has existed there. And when you go to any store in Japan, you'll find Xbox sections, despite some of the bullshit comments I've seen from people. There's always Xbox sections. It's just that it's not that exciting. You know, um, they really tried hard with the original Xbox. The Xbox 360 actually ended up being the... Um, like the anime friendly console over there. People forget that. The three or don't know that. I didn't know that, I should say. But the Xbox 360 is like the spiritual successor to the Sega Saturn over there. Um, it wasn't wildly popular amongst the mainstream, but people who had it fucking loved it because it had nothing but exclusive, like, great Japanese gaming culture experiences on it. That said, it still wasn't an explosion of success. And Xbox One has been a complete disaster over there because it's it's a completely westernized console with all westernized policies kind of shoved into the market where it doesn't really make sense to be. Um, so, in my opinion, Microsoft's going to look at it and be like, do we even really need to be on Japan anymore? Do we need to care about this? What if we drop Japan entirely? And that goes to a greater point that I don't think that Microsoft is ultimately going to make another console, which is the point I've been trying to make here. Like I said in my original predictions video, what I said about Nintendo, basically true. What I said about Sony, I'm completely switching my policy on that. But with Microsoft, I said back then that I thought they were going to evolve into a Steam competitor. And I still think that. Uh, unlike Sony, who can't do that because they're, they have to care about Japan, Microsoft is without that disadvantage. They don't have to care about Japan anymore. If they want to, they can make a Steam competitor. And I think that's part of the reason you see so much Windows 10 and Xbox integration is they're just kind of conditioning you to be like, hey, look at the Xbox brand, yeah, it's cool, but why don't you play those games on a PC instead? You could do that, you know? Um, and I kind of feel like they're eventually going to evolve and just making it an app that functions not only on PCs, but perhaps also mobile devices, and perhaps you don't even know. I mean, it could be an app that shows up on your PS5 in the future. It could show up on, uh, who knows, the Switch, the Switch 2, or if, they, if Nintendo makes anything beyond that, and they probably will. Um, so, again, Nintendo's a little different, but whatever. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm thinking is going to happen there. Now, I'm sure you're pointing out, like, well, why? What's the motivation to do that? Here's a little history lesson. Fun fact about the Xbox brand is that it has never made money. Um, despite how long it's been around, how much money they've dumped into it, it has never turned a profit, which is fucked up. And I know a lot of people are like, that's impossible. That's just not how it works. I'm going to unsubscribe now. Just hang on. Let me explain myself. The original Xbox that came out in 2001... Uh, that console only generated a profit one month of its entire existence. That was November 2004 when Halo 2 dropped. The rest of the time it was perpetually in the red. Ultimately, when it was all you know, tabulated at the end, that console cost Microsoft $4.4 billion. They were negative $4.4 billion by the time the original Xbox was completed. That's where the Xbox brand started going into the 360. 
Now the 360 was a big success, but ultimately would come in third place, funny enough, in that generation. The Wii would win, the PS3 would barely eke out second place, mostly on the back of Japan, and then the Xbox 360 would fall flat uh, as finally being the third place uh, of the three. That said, you're like, well, it was still a big hit, man. Like, it must have made money. It would have in of itself, but the Red Rings of Death fiasco ultimately left them with a $2.3 billion hole. Now, even if you round those two numbers down, you end up with about a $6 billion deficit going into the Xbox One. Now, this is largely why I speculate, and that's all you can really do at this point, speculate that the Xbox One had so many weird policies is they wanted to focus more on ways, additional revenue streams, which is what, even though I hate Don Mantrick for all the terrible things he did to gaming, he was good at writing the ship from an internal financial perspective by basically selling things like ad space and all that kind of shit to try and recoup losses, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that said, the Xbox brand has never turned a profit. And when the Xbox One came out and was a huge disaster initially, if you go back and look at that time frame, there are actually a lot of Microsoft executives pushing for the, um, the basically the, the demise of the Xbox brand. Like, fuck it, we're done with this, let's get rid of it. So why are they still doing it if it's not making money? This I can only guess, but I think this is a holdover of the Bill Gates era. Now, if you're not aware, Bill Gates is a lot like George Lucas in the sense that they are both, they're literally billionaires that are on a list of billionaires who have vowed to give away massive, if not most, of their fortunes to charities and other uh, services around the world for the betterment of humanity. For example, when George Lucas sold Star Wars to Disney, he sold it for $4.4 billion, I think it was, and he, uh, he basically donated the bulk of that, I think it was like $4.1 billion to various charities, mostly through like the US educational system and stuff like that. Um, he didn't keep that money. And Bill Gates is very, very similar. Him and the, you know, he's got the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they do all sorts of wonderful things. And largely what I'm suggesting to you is that part of the reason that the Xbox brand exists is essentially a jobs program and a social charity to give entertainment to the world as well as to employ a whole hell of a lot of people whose lives would are essentially dependent upon it. Microsoft is a, an oddball company in that they are a company with essentially seemingly endless amounts of cash and nothing to do with it. Um, but despite how big they are and how well known they are, they really don't have successful products outside of Windows and Windows related software such as Office. So what do they do? Over time, they've tried different things to become more socially relevant, and it generally failed. Things like the Windows Phone was a complete disaster, or certain things even became a punchline, like the Zoom, the original competitor to the iPod that Microsoft created. That was a joke in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, even though it was a better piece of tech. Microsoft has done that a lot. Like, they came out with, what was it? I don't remember the name of it, but they had a tablet that predated the iPad by, like, 10 years, that everyone was like, yeah, fuck that, that thing's stupid. But stuff like that never works for them. The Xbox is interesting in that it's the same camp of not financial success, but it did actually receive social consciousness. People actually enjoy it. It makes them happy. It's made, it's made like entertainment happen throughout the world, and it's kept a lot of people working. People know the brand and care about the brand, even if they can't turn a profit on it. So I think that you kind of combine all those things, and that's kind of why Microsoft is still doing this. However, every day that we get further away from the time Bill Gates left Microsoft, you have to acknowledge that there are a corporate, there is a corporate board structure who's like, why are we doing this? This is nothing but a red hole. Like, it's just, we just keep losing money on this. That's why I am of the philosophy that you take their current actions, things like, um, you know, combining the Xbox integration with Windows 10 and all that stuff, um, including even things like backwards compatibility is now expected to start running on Windows 10. Um, they're, they're really eliminating the need for actual hardware, and they've been pushing the more digital route for a long time. All the way back in 2013, that was their initial plan. I do believe that it is their plan at some point to drop hardware entirely and just focus on digital, and especially through some sort of service. Now you go, well, wait a minute, they just did Xbox One X, the most powerful gaming console ever. Could you possibly be more wrong? Here's my philosophy on that. I think that the Xbox One X was mostly created as a pride thing. As I mentioned before, they have a history of kind of wanting to do this just to be socially relevant and to be socially exciting, and it's always kind of irked them. You can tell that they came out with the anemic console in a generation. That wasn't their nature. You know, the, X the original Xbox, most capable console of its time. Uh, Xbox 360, while technically the PS3 was more capable, for the most part you never noticed because most people developed with the 360 in mind. Um, but the Xbox One was from the get-go, with the exception of the Wii U and I guess technically the Switch. Um, 
was just considered the bad one. It was considered the joke one, the one that wasn't as good at doing things on a technical level, which is not Microsoft's nature. So they were in a position where they could afford to make the Xbox One X and release it and just justify themselves and get people excited about their brand. I really think that that's what the point of that was. Um, time will tell if the Xbox One ultimately turns a profit, but the Xbox One in of itself might turn a profit, but will that eat up that or clean up that 6.6 .6 or $6 billion hole, let's run down, $6 billion hole? I kind of doubt it, but uh, I guess time will tell on that. But that's why I think we're looking at an all digital future and that will primarily focus on the North American, perhaps European markets, where you can use their service to get whatever games they feel like doing. That way they can keep their jobs program intact, they can keep their app program intact, they can make the board of directors happy by not spending tons of money on hardware, um, and they can still have their brand be associated with the thing they are most known for, which is Windows. Um, so that's that's kind of what I think is going to happen there, but you know, time will tell, we will see. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of it for now uh, on my predictions and all that stuff. Uh, I want to thank you very much for watching, and I will see you all later.